Okay, I want to welcome you all back to the third and final afternoon uh, segment of our program. Uh, this particular se segment, as you know, is about the alien abduction phenomena, you know, particularly as how it may relate to uh, memory phenomena as well. We think we have a group of three very interesting uh, speakers here for you. Uh, and after at the end, we'll have our usual questions and hopefully have questions from the audience as well. Um, and a group, good group of panelists as well to uh, ask questions you know, of, the, of our authorities here as well. Our first speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Thomas Bullard, uh, who I think prefers being called Eddie, uh, who is a, uh, from the University of Indiana at Bloomington. Uh, he received his BA in folklore and, uh, at North Carolina, a place of great celebration these days, I gather, uh, and his MA and PhD in folklore studies uh, from Indiana University. Uh, he now works as a librarian in the Indiana University Libraries. An early interest in UFOs uh, became a topic for his, ultimately his PhD research theme. Uh, Dr. Bullard is the author of a series of publications about the alien abduction phenomena and is a recognized authority you know, among ufological circles you know, on that particular phenomena. Notable are his two-volume comparative study of alien abduction stories, uh, UFOs, The Measure of a Mystery, uh, and The Sympathetic Ear, a more recent publication, uh, The Investigator as a Variable and Influence on the UFO Abduction Report. Uh, Dr. Bullard's topic today is myth, memory, and experience in UFO abduction claims. So without further ado, I give you Dr. Bullard. UFO uh, abduction phenomenon is a story, a claim, that people have been uh, kidnapped by creatures from alien spaceships, taken aboard the alien spaceship and given uh, some kind of uh, medical examination, usually a rather horrific one that involves uh, getting stuck with needles and uh, prodded with some kind of uh, mechanical devices and perhaps having uh, either eggs or sperm removed to create uh, alien hybrid children. Now this is a very fantastic story, quite obviously, and uh, for that reason it has good reason to be among the, in the company of the stories that we've been hearing here today about satanic ritual abuse and uh, uh, false memories of, uh, of childhood abuse of, of usually very unusual nature. The UFO abduction story started in 1961 when a couple were driving through the uh, mountains of, uh, of New Hampshire, Barney and Betty Hill. They started to notice a little light that kept following them. They watched that light for about two hours as it seemed to get closer and closer and uh, become ever more, uh, ever larger, ever more structured. Until finally the thing swung in front of them and uh, as Barney got out of the car and looked through binoculars, he looked up and saw uh, the windows of the thing and uh, through the binoculars. And he also saw alien creatures looking back at him from the windows. He became convinced that the uh, aliens were about to capture him, so he got back in the car and drove off in a panic. The object drew even closer until it filled the windshield of the car. The couple then heard a beeping sound, and then they heard another set of beeping sounds, and the object was gone. And as they drove along, they noticed a signpost that said that they were quite a number of miles away from where they had been before. And they reached home in, uh, in Portsmouth, later to realize that uh, about two hours had passed that they couldn't account for. As they got home, they, were, they had some very odd sensations of, of, that something had happened, but they didn't know what. They felt dirty. Uh, Barney went to examine himself, examine parts of his body, thinking that something had touched him or something had uh, uh, you know, contaminated him. Betty didn't want the, the luggage brought inside, and she took off the dress she had worn, threw it in a closet, and never wore it again. Within about a week, she started having nightmares of, uh, of strange beings stopping the car and taking them aboard the, uh, uh, what looked like a, uh, a flying saucer. 
Barney didn't want to have anything to do with this story. He didn't want to listen to it. He didn't want to hear anything about it. He just sort of clammed up about it. But that didn't work very well because he soon, his ulcers soon began to flare up and he suffered considerably over the next uh, two years where he went from doctor to doctor trying to find some kind of uh, ease for his suffering. And he was finally referred to a, a psychiatrist in Boston who used hypnosis to try to recover what the psychiatrist thought was some sort of memories that had caused a traumatic experience for these people. Now this, uh, this psychiatrist applied hypnosis to both Barney and Betty, thinking that they were both involved in some way. And no sooner did he did so than he started getting this truly bizarre story that as soon as that beeping sound started, the uh, hills sort of lost their memory. They drove on beyond that point, but they turned off the main road for some inexplicable reason. They wound up on some back road and they met with a roadblock of some strange short beings who were blocking the road. And when they stopped the car, they simply had no will, no resistance. These beings had become completely in control. The, uh, the beings led Barney and Betty out of the car. Barney wouldn't even open his eyes. The beings just sort of led him along. Betty was a little more uh, spirited and uh, resisted that, but she still couldn't resist the urge to walk with them into the woods. And once she walked into the woods, there was the, uh, the UFO that they had seen in the sky sitting on the ground. They went inside and they went their separate ways and each began receiving a medical examination. Uh, she ultimately had some long needles stuck into her abdomen and the aliens made some motion across her, uh, her forehead and the pain went away. Barney, for his part, mainly kept his, uh, kept his eyes closed as the aliens apparently instructed him throughout the time, but they gave him a genital exam and that's why apparently he went home and examined himself as soon as he arrived home, still feeling that, uh, that strange feeling that something had happened that he couldn't remember. So after the uh, examination, the alien showed Betty this uh, map of a, of a star system and talked with her for a while. Then uh, the aliens let them go. They went back to the car and watched the spaceship take off. And as soon as they started driving off again, they heard the beeping sound again. And after that point, their memories began to fade. And by the time they reached home, they had no memories whatsoever of the time they spent, uh, uh, the time between the two sets of beeps. After, the, uh, after the, this uh, encounter, the Hills had some other peculiar behaviors, like a desire to return to the site of where they, had, uh, where they thought that the event had happened, uh, a desire, uh, a continued sense that something had happened that, and that it, they didn't know what it was. This has been a fairly continuous thing in reports after. There were a few cases earlier on, some even as early as the 1950s, where people uh, experienced the missing time phenomenon. And then after the Hill case was published in 1966, some other cases started coming forward, slowly at first, but then by the time, uh, of, by the late 1970s, Bud Hopkins in particular had started using hypnosis or getting some uh, psychologists to apply hypnosis to people who had similar missing time experiences or very strange encounters with a, a light in the sky or something that gave them a strange, left them with a strange feeling that something had happened that they didn't know what it was. After that, the number of uh, cases began to multiply until you started getting thousands of cases of people claiming to have been abducted by aliens, uh, sometimes as often as three times a week. These uh, stories came not only from North America but from Europe, uh, particularly the English-speaking world, but uh, they were also very common in South America. They've, there have been cases from uh, Russia, China, Africa. In other words, it's a fairly universal phenomenon, or at least a universal claim, that people have had these kinds of strange experiences. Well, these are obviously 
very unusual experiences. I mean, the devil is unusual enough, but this is even stranger than the devil. It's a form of, a, it's a techno devil, a technological form of magic. Once again, you have people captured in the dark. You have people uh, subjected to tortures, body fluids removed, not necessarily blood. It's usually uh, semen for men and eggs for women, but sometimes blood is removed as well. But anyway, we see a pattern, a similar pattern to one that we might find in the, uh, in the witchcraft cases, a fairy kidnap in the folklore of, uh, that's quite common throughout history. But we also have a story that has become very popular. It's, it's extremely well known now. You find uh, alien head uh, cookie jars and you find uh, aliens in the movies, magazines, newspapers. You can't even get through the, through the checkout shelf of the uh, grocery store without seeing aliens shaking hands with Bill Clinton in the tabloids or something of that sort. And if you go to the websites, they're innumerable. There's one that even says, uh, has asked the question, uh, should I uh, baptize my alien hybrid child? And then there's a long theological discussion that goes along with it. But anyway, the the alien notion is, of course, quite, a, quite well known now. And no one would deny that probably most people in the world, unless they've been living on another planet, now know pretty much what goes into it. So uh, from what we've heard today, we find pretty much all the poisonous ingredients that go to make false memories. We have hypnosis used to bring out many of these cases. We have uh, a very bizarre story. We have people who suspect something happened to them and self-select themselves to go to people who will examine them for alien abductions. And these uh, alien abduction investigators will, of course, ask questions that will be leading toward revelations of an alien abduction experience. And of course, the cultural script is there, either in the mind of the, uh, of the abductee or would-be abductee, or in the mind of the, in, of the investigator who will ask the right questions to bring this out. So all in all, this seems like the ideal case for false memory. So we could think that here's one more strange claim that's uh, that the books will be closed on it, we won't have to examine them anymore, and that we know the answer. Well, I'm here to spoil the celebration. There is something genuinely unusual about these cases that seems to go a bit beyond what, we've, what we know about false memories. As a case in point, I'll offer up the example of uh, Carrie Mullis. Now, his name may not be a household name for everyone, but he is in every genetics laboratory in the country. He won the uh, Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1993 for uh, the polymerase chain reaction, which is a way of duplicating uh, DNA. If you saw the movie Jurassic Park, it's one of the processes necessary for taking uh, DNA out of amber and uh, multiplying it so that you can make a dinosaur. So anyway, he is a, 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 an individual of some intellectual significance. And he has an abduction story to tell in his book, autobiographical book called uh, Dancing Naked in the Mind Field. He had a cabin in Northern California in the mountains. And uh, one day in 1985, he took a drive up into the mountains to his cabin. He arrived about midnight, took in the groceries, turned on the uh, solar battery uh, uh, lights that he kept there. And he picked up his uh, big flashlight to go to the outhouse. As he was going toward the outhouse, he saw something glowing under a tree. It wasn't very big, it was just glowing. And he shined the light there, and he saw a luminous raccoon. He saw the raccoon's black, beady little eyes looking at him. And as he walked up to it, the raccoon spoke to him and said, 
good evening, Dr. Mullis. And he said, he answered something equally polite. And the next thing he knew, it was six hours later, he was wandering around in the woods. He hadn't been asleep because his clothes were, were not dirty and uh, they were dry even though the dew was very heavy that night. He couldn't find his flashlight. He went back to look for the raccoon. Of course, the raccoon wasn't there. He didn't know what had happened to him. He was rather sleepy, so he went to sleep for a while. But when he woke up, he still remembered the raccoon very vividly. And he decided he'd go out into one part of the woods to clean a, a drain pipe from the, the spring that uh, was out there. And as he started to go into that area of the woods, he was overtaken by terror. He simply could not go into the woods. It was his favorite spot of the woods, yet he couldn't uh, bear to go out there. And it was a, quite a while before he could go out there alone. And uh, two years later, this book came out. He Im immediately noticed it because he said he had some vague recognition of that face. Now, he didn't have any kind of explosive uh, recollection of meeting with aliens or meeting with anything that looked like that. But it was just a very strange experience. And, his, uh, and he later decided that he was going to do something about his fear of that area of the woods. He was going to try a little uh, frontier, what he called it, frontier psychotherapy. So he took an automatic rifle out there started yelling at whatever was out there, whatever was haunting him, and told him to, to either show itself or if it, you know, if it didn't belong there, to get out anyway, because he was gonna shoot the place up. And then he then proceeded to unload two clips on this, uh, on this general area. And after that, he felt like he could go back into the woods again. It didn't bother him in the same way. Now, what we have here is what would seem to be a very bizarre personal story. And if it were only one person's story, it could stay at that. It would remain just one person's weird tale. But his daughter had a similar experience there. She was grown, she was there with her fiance, and uh, she too lapsed into this time, uh, this missing time state, and was gone for several hours. And her fiance was looking for her all this time. She also recognized this cover when, it, when the book came out and, was, and called her father to tell him about it just at the time he had started to read the thing, having independently discovered the book. In 1993, when he was celebrating winning the Nobel Prize, he had a bunch of people out there and one of his neighbors who was attending the, meet, uh, the, uh, the party also met with something like a luminous animal that then metamorphosed into a human form. Again, very weird tales. But for abductees, these are rather common. Now, the usual image of abduction is somebody who has no memory of what's going on. They just go into a hypnotist or a, uh, a UFO investigator, and they discover an alien abduction out of nowhere. But that's not nearly as often the case as you know maybe uh, common knowledge would think that many people do have these experiences of meeting with some kind of strange, seemingly supernatural animal, possibly luminous, but always with very noticeable eyes, very large eyes like an owl or a, a deer with very noticeable eyes. This is a very common way. It, it's not the most common way to come by an abduction, but it's certainly a sizable minority of, of people who report these things report going through this kind of an experience of seeing something first, then lapsing into forgetfulness, then having, recovering with some kind of very troubling memory, something that keeps nagging at them, or, or having some kind of terrified reactions. Betty Hill came up on a roadblock one time a few months after her, uh, her abduction she panicked at the sight of this police roadblock because it reminded her of that thing that uh, she saw with the little alien types. And uh, Mullis didn't have anything that specific, but it's very common for people to have 
terrified reactions at, say, a doctor's office or something like that, which will then result into a, uh, a UFO abduction. Now, again, it's hard to say what to make of all this, but we do have to raise some questions about the, uh, about the, the notion, what's, what's become sort of a consensus notion, I would think, that uh, false memory can explain many of the, uh, can completely explain all these phenomena. There's, there's certainly the, uh, the element of people who might possibly be predisposed by uh, being fantasy prone to believing certain odd things. There certainly are people like that. There's no reason that I have seen, I think maybe Dr. McNally may have something different to say, that there may be more of that out there than, uh, than we would think, although there have been some studies done using abductees that uh, exonerate them from, having, from being fantasy prone individuals. But there again, we'll, we'll let Dr. McNally have his say on that. There certainly is an element of self-selection. There are people who go to abduction investigators because that's what they think they had, and obviously if they think that much, then they, are, they have some idea of what's going on. But as far as the cultural script goes, I have some objections to that theory as being uh, capable of explaining everything that goes on in abductions for both uh, theoretical and practical reasons. On the theoretical side, as a folklorist, I recognize that, yes, there are such things as cultural scripts, but they are things from which people ad-lib and ad-lib gladly if the source of it is only imaginary. Take the uh, urban legends that we're all so familiar with. They're very concise stories. They're almost like jokes insofar as they, you change one word or one line and the things don't work anymore. They are not stories that anyone would be readily able to alter. And yet, people do alter them. Imagination does a wonderful job of working out every possible variant on these urban legends. There'll be different, there'll be the same plots with different, uh, different actors. There'll be uh, the same actors in different plots. But these things, show that human imagination is very capable of taking any kind of story and altering it wonderfully. But with abductions, you don't even have a tightly organized story. What you have is a very loosely organized thing that would readily uh, lend itself to people uh, imagining, say, uh, uh, extraterrestrial romances or adventure stories. But if you actually look at the stories, they're boring. If you, the more of them you go through, the more of them, the more they are alike, down to some very small details. Now, if you look at the uh, satanic ritual abuse stories, there's a great deal of similarity in them as far as certain motifs and plot structures go, but if you look at them individually, they ten tend to remain individualistic. Whereas, if you look at the abduction stories carefully, they do not. There's very little individualization in any of these stories. So that's the theoretical side. On the practical side, would you, would you consider for a minute how many images of aliens Hollywood has shown? If you go back to the 1950s movies, every, every uh, Every movie had a different alien. If you go to the more modern ones, you have Predator and Alien and E.T. and all the others. But there's a tremendous amount of difference that we've been bombarded with. Uh, I brought along a few friends. Yeah, the uh, alien friends. Yeah, that one. Can you? Will you be able to roll this up? Okay, now here are some of the, well, I should introduce these a little better. There have been at least uh, two events, two media events that would have a great deal of influence on the image of the alien. 
One was Steven Spielberg's uh, late 1977 movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which introduced uh, to a, a worldwide audience the little alien, the very thin alien with the big eyes, big dark eyes. And then again uh, in 1987, when Whitley Strieber's uh, book cover came out, and also Bud Hopkins' book on uh, uh, the woman who was abducted and her uh, fetus was stolen and uh, was later introduced to a, uh, uh, you know, a hybrid alien child. Well, these are some of the aliens that were seen prior to 1977, or at least late in the year of 1977. These were all illustrations that were either made by the abductees or with the sanction of the abductees. They were all, as it were, in the can prior to the release of the movie, so they couldn't have been influenced by it. Now, some of these are really bizarre. The one in the upper left corner, <laughs> uh, the one alien looked like a giant tombstone, and another one looked like a jukebox. Then you get another one that looks like a giant brain. And then you get some that look, uh, you know, quasi-human, and there's even a, a sort of a Bigfoot-type creature. These are rather uh, unusual types. And I'll go to the next one. But this was the more common type of alien. The upper left hand's one drawn by uh, Barney Hill, and then there are several others. Some of these came, uh, like the one in the lower right-hand corner, came from Germany, a place where there wasn't a great deal of uh, cultural influence, although you see that the uh, well-dressed alien wore a kind of a harlequin ruff in those days. Now, next one. And here's some more that are similar, a little, maybe a little bit different. The uh, kind of darkish one on the left-hand side came from France again at a time when there wasn't a great deal of cultural influence of any sort. And here again, uh, they become a little bit more different. You'll get the occasional uh, human feet, uh, creature with the, the beard. Sometimes they're even described as being very beautiful or Nordic types. And uh, anyway, this is not really a representative sample. About uh, 75 to 80 percent of all the aliens are the little humanoid types with the big eyes. This was true uh, before Steven Spielberg's movie. It stayed true between the movie and the release of uh, Whitley Strieber's book, and it's remained true since the release of Strieber's book. Three out of every four aliens you meet is going to be a short little guy Three, four feet, three to five feet tall, big head, no hair, big eyes, very businesslike disposition, not very friendly. But anyway, the, ca the case I want to make is that there are certainly, there seems to be an experiential element to these encounters, at least some of them, that cannot be attributed solely to Paul's memory. There is certainly the case of sleep paralysis, which uh, David Hufford has uh, delineated, and that's certainly a large a number of these cases have intruded onto this abduction phenomenon because people just don't know anything about sleep paralysis. It's a very frightening experience. You wake up in the night, you're, you can't move, you have a sensation that something is coming into the room, you may even sense a presence or see a presence, it may oppress you, uh, you may not be able to breathe. It's a very terrifying experience. Uh, Herman Melville talks about it in one of the early chapters of Moby Dick, but he didn't know anything about the, uh, the tradition, he didn't know anything about it. Most people don't. Rather than think they're crazy, they'd rather think they'd been abducted by aliens. But there still seems to be something more, some experience similar to what, uh, what Carrie Mullis underwent. All I want to say you know, you don't have to accept the explanation for the particular claims. You can separate them from the claims themselves. There may be something there, and I would argue that it would be a very mistaken notion to foreclose any 
further research on this phenomenon simply because we think we have an answer and uh, because in many ways it does seem similar to Paul's memory. There may be something else there. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker here uh, is Dr. Richard McNally. Uh, Dr. Richard McNally received his uh, BS in psychology from Wayne State University in 1976 and his PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Illinois at Chicago in 1982. In 1984, he was appointed assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Health Sciences, the Chicago Medical School, where he established the Anxiety Disorders Clinic he moved to the Department of Psychology at Harvard University in 1991, where he's now the professor. Uh, he has more than 240 publications to his credit, most of these concerning anxiety disorders, such as post-traumatic stress disorder, something that has been associated with alien abductees, as a matter of fact, uh, panic disorder, obsessive compulsive disorders, uh, and has, uh, his work includes books on these subjects, such, uh, such as Panic Disorder, A Critical Analysis, and Remembering Trauma, uh, a Harvard University Press book. A current research focus of his concerns the application of cognitive psychology methods to study individuals reporting histories of childhood sexual abuse, uh, including those claiming to have repressed and recovered memories of abuse. Uh, he served on the American Psychiatric Association's DSM-4, Advisory Committees on Post-Traumatic Stress Syndrome. Uh, he is a fellow of the American Psychological Society and a licensed clinical psychologist in Massachusetts. Uh, he believes also that uh, uh, his understandings about uh, repressed memory have something to tell us about the uh, alien abduction phenomena as well. And he has recently been doing uh, experimental work with uh, alien abductees. Uh, today, his topic is going to be explaining the space alien abduction phenomena. So I give you Dr. McNally. Thank you very much. Um, ooh, this is really loud, isn't it? I just talked too loud. The, uh, uh, I'm delighted to be here today, and I think it's especially cool that it's at a, a community college. Uh, Phil had mentioned that I got my bachelor's degree at Wayne State University in Detroit, which is true, but I did my first two years of higher education at Henry Ford Community College. That's in Dearborn, Michigan, right next to Detroit. And uh, I had um, some magnificent teachers at the community college. Those are the ones who sort of first sparked my interest in psychology. Um, and so it's, uh, I'm delighted. Uh,